All right then. Okay. Hello everyone. Okay, uh, welcome back to our seminar series, Information Theory in Singapore, ITIS. This is our first talk in 2021, and my name is Hamal. And welcome back to Virtual Singapore. Okay, so as you heard just now, okay, what you see here is Singapore's Changi Airport, which is getting a bit busier, but still very quiet during these unusual times. Okay, and of course, like everyone, uh, let's hope that this strange time pass soon and we can, you can visit this airport in person sometime soon. Now, for those who are joining us for the first time, the Information Theory in Singapore ITS Seminar Series is organized by a team that includes Mehu Tani from uh, National University of Singapore, Kui Chai and Tuan Tang Nguyen from SUTD, Singapore University of Technology and Design, and me, Han Mao Kia from Nanyang Technological University. Our aim is to promote, advocate, and spread the joy of coding theory and information theory within Singapore and around the world. We have five talks lined up for these two months, February and March, and today is our first talk. Now, before we get going, let me address a few logistical issues. Click, please keep your microphone and video muted for the duration of the talk. If you have questions, you can post them to our chat group and we'll keep a lookout for it. We'll address questions in the Q&A session at the end of the talk. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Navin Kashyap as our speaker. Professor Kashyap is currently a professor at the Department of Electrical Communication Engineering at the Indian Institute of Science. His research interests lie primarily in the application of combinatorial and probabilistic methods in information and coding theory. Professor Kashyap served as the editorial board of the IEEE Transactions on Information Theory during 2009 to 2014 and was appointed as a distinguished lecturer of the Information Theory Society from 2017 to 2018. He's a recipient of the Swana Jayanti Fellowship awarded by the Department of Science and Technology and is at present an associate editor for the Siam Journal on Discrete Mathematics and the Springer Journal on Cryptography and Communications. Well, in my few years as a researcher, Navin's papers has always been a delight to read. His papers not only address difficult problems in communications, but also introduce, introduces many beautiful and deep mathematics. And I always find something new to learn. So today, I believe I will learn something new too. So the title of his talk is Capacity Encoding for Binary Input Memoryless Channels with Run Length Limited Input Constraints. Professor Keshap, please. Thank you very much, Han Mao, Ma <clears throat> and thanks to all the organizers for um, uh, for inviting me to give this uh, inaugural talk in this series. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think, the, at least looking at the program from last year, it was uh, you know a set of very highly distinguished uh, lecturers, and I hope that uh, I can live up to those standards. Um, and that thanks also for the people who are attending this talk. Um, so, uh, Hanmao, can you tell me whether like uh, this time limit is going to be strictly adhered to, or is it like somewhat flexible? <laughs> uh, very flexible. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not really sure like how much it yeah. might take. I think. Sure. Sure. And also, no I think uh, yeah. So this talk, um, I mean, I'm going to. It, it it could be that like it is. Kind of, it may not be very uh, familiar material for many of you. I mean, the, the problem setting and formulation, etc., is pretty standard, pretty straightforward, and indeed, very most of you will find it very comfortable. But the techniques, finally, and the kind of uh, you know the uh, uh, yeah the techniques that we'll be getting that we'll be using to address these questions could be quite uh, different from what you have been encoded from what they have encountered in a standard information theory or coding theory course. So let's see. Um, so it's more control theoretic, I suppose. Um, yeah, so anyhow, I'm going to, and like, there is a lot of ground that I'd like to cover, I suppose. And so it might be going a bit too fast, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I'll, I'll highlight the salient points of what I would like to, you know, sort of focus on. And at the same time, of course, the talk is recorded and I'll provide enough references, etc. So that, uh, you know, anybody who wants to learn more about this material can can do so. Um, so this talk is, uh, is joint work with a bunch of collaborators. I uh, started out with uh, Chaim Perbuter and his group, uh, Oran Sabah, who is a PhD student of his, and he's in our postdoc at Caltech, I think. Uh, and Bashar Vilayhel is also a, was a master's student of uh, Chaim's. 
Um, then uh, Arvind and Ashish are students of mine. Arvind is my PhD student and Ashish is a master's student here. Okay, so um, without further ado, let me get going. Uh, <clears throat> right, so I, I mean, it's just a slide on motivation. I don't really think there is much need to motivate this problem for the audience that I am aiming it at, uh, because I think it's kind of natural. Most of you are quite familiar, I think, with, uh, uh, with run length limited codes. Uh, with run length limited constraints uh, and so constraint coding etc uh, many of you are certainly i see many experts here uh, so all i'm doing to that is add a channel uh, so you know we're adding a memoryless channel through which run length limited codes or run length limited sequences will be passed and we want to ask questions about what the capacity of such a channel then will be uh, since the channel is memoryless uh, by itself if you did not have any constraints at the input of the channel, then capacity, et cetera, are at least well understood. But when you start putting constraints at the input, capacity becomes less understood. In fact, as you see, highly, I mean, sort of very little understood uh, uh, concept. Um, anyhow, motivation just comes from, well, you have discrete memoryless channels, which are ubiquitous uh, in their applications, random, they, mo they model random noise uh, that affect the transmission and storage of digital data. Uh, con then coded sequences, uh, well, we have constraint coding. Constraint coding is also well, highly well motivated. Uh, it is, uh, again, all over the place in uh, storage media. It is used all over the place in storage media, magnetic tapes, hard drives, CDs, et cetera, flash memory, DNA-based computing and storage. Uh, and like many of, I, I know that uh, uh, at Singapore, people also a lot of work with, uh, you know, the uh, uh, power line coding for power line communications, or especially the simultaneous information and energy transfer uh, sub block constraints, uh, which is, I think, Mehul and his group have been doing for quite a while. Um, uh, so these are, I mean, so I don't really want to, I don't need to motivate constraint coding. So I'm just putting the two things together, two very well motivated uh, concepts, the discrete memoryless channels and constraint codes. Um, and so from a theoretical standpoint, uh, when you put these two things together, that is you have constraint coding, constraint codes or constraint sequences at the input of a discrete memoryless channel. Overall, this class of channels, the overall channel then falls into the class of a channel with memory it is because the constraint itself holds memory. We need to know what to send. The next bit to be sent into the channel will depend on what the past bits were because if the next bit to be sent in violates the constraint, then the channel that would not be allowed to be sent into the channel. Um, so this is, we will see that we will only be focusing on, of course, finite state channels where there is a finite amount of memory associated with the constraint. And for the, for the most part, in fact, I will focus on, uh, uh, the, on the binary erasure channel to keep things simple and ideas more or less concrete. We will focus on the binary erasure channel with run length limited constraints at the input. Uh, we're all, I think, familiar, or most of us, I think, here at this talk will be familiar with the DKRLL constraints. Uh, it's a, so we say that a binary sequence is uh, is DKRLL constraint or a DK run length limited constraint. If uh, each pair of successive ones in that sequence is separated by at least D zeros and every run of zeros is of length at most K. So if, uh, there's a constraint on the run lengths of zeros. Okay? So uh, zero run, a maximal zero run must have length at least D and at most K. Um, <clears throat> so it is, this is again, some simple one example that I put down here of a, sequence satisfying a two seven RLL constraint. So the runs of zeros have length at most, at least two and at most four in this example. I don't think, I think the binary erasure channel is also quite well known or uh, familiar with to the audience, to this audience. That is, uh, it's a binary input channel and each input bit either gets transmitted faithfully to the output with probability one minus epsilon or with probability epsilon gets erased at the output. Okay, and it's a, by itself, the channel is memoryless in that, uh, if there were no constraints at the input, if the inputs were unconstrained, the channel is truly a discrete memoryless channel. All right. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, for DK uh, run length RLL constraints, it's again well known that uh, they they have they come with this what are called graphical presentations. That is, uh, to generate sequences satisfying the constraint, one can look at these graphs, the presentations of that constraint, and uh, these are edge labeled directed graphs. Uh, and as you walk along parts of this graph and you read off the labels of edges along paths, you will get sequences satisfying the constraint. So these are all classical. This is the so-called, what do we call the Shannon cover of the uh, the first, like the, the graph on top, GDK, the Shannon cover of the DKRL constraint when uh, 
k is less than infinity when you allow k to be infinity that is there are no upper there is no upper bound on the lengths of zero runs then uh, here is the uh, this is the shannon cover of the d infinity constraint uh, so one piece of notation that i will keep carrying with me are these so two things i suppose G, gdk as well as sdk uh, script script gdk and script sdk gdk are, is the graphs that uh, these these directed graphs these labeled graphs and sdk are uh, is the is the vertex set uh, of these graphs okay so k can be infinity so the set of vertices of these graphs will be denoted by sdk states s is uh, represents s is supposed to represent the term states all right um so the particular problem uh, okay so we have uh, uh, a discrete memoryless channel with run length constraints at the input but we also potentially allow feedback um that is like so we consider a discrete memoryless channel with an input constraint and sometimes but we'll also we will allow feedback i mean we can choose to ignore the feedback if we don't want it but like the then the general problem that we are sort of considering is the setting of a discrete memoryless channel with an input constraint and feedback and feed so here you have a constraint encoder that is uh, you know a message bit you have some messages which have to be Uh, encoded and transmitted into the channel, and uh, the codes, the, the sequence of the the the, the sequence of uh, symbols that enter the channel must satisfy the input constraint. Uh, the channel itself is memoryless by itself, but like because of, but the constraint will add memory. Uh, the feedback is noiseless feedback with a with unit delay. That is, it's causal noiseless feedback. That is, when output at time i comes out of the channel, it gets fed back. to the input that is the next input uh the, the into the channel the input at time i the ith input into the channel depends not only on the message being transmitted message to be transmitted but also all the outputs that have taken that have come out of the channel uh, up to time i minus 1 okay all of those get taken into account in order to determine the message bit uh, the the next symbol to be put into the channel to be transmitted into the channel uh at the at the end of the transmission you let this happen for a certain number of uh, time time instances or time steps and then you de you make a decision about what the message being what the actual message being transmitted was so you after having received n outputs uh, n output symbols you make a decision about what the message being transmitted was okay so this is the setup of a discrete memoryless channel with an input constraint and feedback um see if the if we did not have constraints at the input if the encoder were unconstrained if that like there were uh, did not have to satisfy any uh, input constraint uh, then this is classical it goes back to the work of shannon of course uh, and we uh, as is well known feedback uh, does not increase the capacity of a discrete memoryless channel okay um however uh, but what feedback can do even in that case is that it can simplify coding schemes right even if the capacity of the channel is not Uh, even if the channel the feedback does not increase the capacity of a channel uh, it can still simplify coding scheme so for example if i look at the binary erasure channel uh, the capacity of that is well known to be 1 minus epsilon either with or without feedback with without feedback you will need to use some sophisticated error correcting code etc but uh, if you allow feedback it's a very simple coding scheme that you can use to send a particular bit 0 or 1 you just repeatedly transmit that bit until that bit is successfully received at the other end that's all because each time you know whether like because of the feedback you will know whether the bit was that was transmitted in the last time instant got actually successfully received or not so the transmitter will know uh, so it can use feedback and just keep repeating until it can until that bit gets through um, so no sophisticated error correction etc required here um or erasure correction uh, and like uh, to see what the rate of this coding scheme is the expected number of channel uses for successful transmission of a single bit would of course be the mean of the of a binomial of a geometric dis, of a geometric distribution of a geometric random variable so it is 1 over 1 minus epsilon and uh, so 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 that is an expected number of channel uses for a successful transmission of one bit so the coding rate if you think of it is basically arbitrarily close to uh, one one bit that is the number of uh, the uh, the amount of information that you want that you want to convey and amount of channel uses it takes you divided by the number of channel uses on an average that it takes you to convey that amount of information so 1 divided by 1 over 1 minus epsilon 1 divided by 1 over 1 minus epsilon which just gives you 1 minus epsilon and that's it okay so it's as simple you can achieve capacity in a very simple coding scheme using just i mean it's it's a variable length coding scheme but again you can make it fixed length by by resorting to the law of large numbers and so on which is not something okay it's not some, not something that i really want to focus on we can we'll leave it with variable length coding schemes 
Um, okay, so, uh, so that is what uh, feedback allows you to do, even if it does not increase the capacity, it's considerably, uh, allows us to considerably simplify coding schemes. Um, on the other hand, in the setting that now we're interested that uh, this talk is focused on of uh, DMCs with input constraint and feedback, feedback in fact can and usually does increase the capacity. Okay, these are channels now with memory overall because of the constraint on the input. And for channels with memory overall, generally speaking, uh, capacity does increase when there is feedback involved. And in this case, as we will see particularly, we'll see concrete examples where feedback does actually increase capacity. Strictly increase capacity. Uh, okay, I've been talking about capacity. Um, so this is kind of starting of the first technical part of this talk. Uh, so these are the two expressions that I will work with. Um, capacity of DMCs with constrained input. These are all classical, as in, well, at least the first part of it is highly classical. It goes back to the work of at least Gallagher, even prior to that, I would say. This has just been taken out of Gallagher's textbook. Uh, capacity without feedback for an input constraint channel because it's basically a, it is a special case of a finite state channel and the capacity is well known to be you look at n letter expression n letter expression you let n go to infinity you take the, uh, the mutual information between n input symbols and corresponding uh, n output symbols uh, you divide that by capital divide by that by n you take the maximum overall input distributions that uh, sat, that are supported on sequences that satisfy the input constraint so that is important that is the probability that associated with the sequence Probabilities, these are distributions at the input distribution such that uh, the probability that it assigns to sequences that do not satisfy the particular constraint that we are operating, the probability that assigned to sequences that do not satisfy the constraint is zero. So only sequences that satisfy the constraint get assigned non-zero probabilities by such input distributions. So we can call them admissible if you like input distributions. Uh, and then you let the limit as n goes, limit n go to infinity. Okay, the limit we, it again, so this is well known that this limit exists by subadditivity arguments. Uh, so this is what is called the capacity without feedback. Um, it's an n-letter expression, and like again, it has meaning in that like it is not just an information theoretic definition. It is it, there is an interpretation. There's a coding theorem associated with it. Um, that is like you know if, if you have as long as you're operating at rates below capacity, you can get arbitrarily you can you have feedback coding schemes that or you have coding schemes that uh, for this for this channel, essentially random coding schemes that, uh, um, you know, for which the probability of error can be made as small as you like. And if you're operating at rates above capacity, again, you have a convex. That is probability of error will get arbitrarily close to one. Right, uh, capacity with feedback. Again, there is a corresponding expression for it, also well known. Uh, here, this exposition, I am based up, basing it on this work of uh, young Kavchicha Tatikonda, although Tatikonda, I would say again, this 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 expression perhaps goes back even well before Patikonda. I mean, it, it was already known to like people like uh, Jim Massey in the 1980s. Uh, maybe, and it probably goes back even earlier. But like this, uh, just the development that I'm going to talk about goes back to the work of Tatikonda, Tatikonda's PhD thesis, to be precise. So the feedback capacity is given by again an expression. It's an n-letter expression. Uh, this in this quantity within the summation is called what is called the directed information. Uh, this guy here is called directed information. So it, uh, it replaces mutual information by something called directed mutual information. Um, and uh, because of, so yeah, um, and it is a specific definition that it is the uh, mutual information between the input at time t and the output at time t, but conditioned on all the previous outputs up to time t minus one. And you take the summation t going from one to n. And you can let it, you divide this by n and let m, n go to infinity. Um, and that gives you an information rate uh, uh, with feedback that is achievable and you take the supremum overall input distributions that are again that respect the input constraint. So here just the structure of the input distributions is kind of interest or is something that you should uh, that I will try to explain. So it's a probability on so it's a probability probability distribution on symbols at the t, at the tth time instant at time instant t. So input symbol at time t has a particular probability distribution and that probability distribution depends on the particular state of the input the state of the constraint up to time t minus at time t minus one, just prior to when that input has to be sent into the channel. Um, and so that state will take on values of, from one of the states of the presentation of the input constraint of the DKRLL constraint. And also, since we're allowing feedback, it's so the input to be, dis, to be sent into the channel at time t will also depend on all the previous outputs that have come out of the channel up to time t minus one. Um, the only thing is that like, uh, yeah, so we must make sure that like these are, uh, we, uh, uh, 
So the supremum is taken over. So these distributions, this family of probability distributions must respect the input constraint. In other words, if, um, so XT will take, for so in the, in the, in the uh, when we're talking about uh, DK and length limited constraints, uh, ST minus one is one of the states of the presentation of the constraint. And so you, if XT is, XT will be equal to one, if and only, or XT is allowed to be equal to one, that is the probability of, get, of throwing in an XT into the channel at time T, uh, probability of throwing in a one into the channel at time t will be not non-zero, will be strictly positive if and only if there is an edge from, there is an edge labeled one from that particular state of the presentation. Uh, there's an edge labeled one leaving that particular state of the presentation. So that is at that state, you're uh, allowed to actually input a one into the channel without violating the constraint. Okay, so that is how you're going to be taking. So again, yeah, so these are the fam, so the supremum is taken over these type of distributions, input distributions. Okay, so any questions here? I mean, this is uh, basically, I mean, how you derive these things is not particularly you know, important to us. We will be working with just these expressions. But again, there are, there are these, these are, uh, there's coding theorems that back all of these things. That is, uh, there are feedback, as long as you're operating at rate below this expression, there are feedback coding schemes that let uh, for which the probability of error can be made vanishingly small. And at rates above this expression, there is no coding scheme for which rate can be made less than epsilon. It will be, the rates in fact will go towards one. Uh, the probability of error will in fact go towards one. Okay. Okay, so, so the kind of questions that we will address in this talk are, well, number one, can, these are multilateral expressions involving supremums, limits, and all kinds of things. Uh, can these actually be computed easily? I mean, these are like, uh, this is a family of input distributions. I mean, uh, I mean, actually you have to, and you have to define, you, you need one such input distribution for every time instant T. So in fact, it's an infinite family of input distributions for defined for every value of little t. Um, so, you know, so there's not at all clear whether these things are even tractable. You, might, you can define them, but can you actually evaluate them? Uh, not at all clear. And that is one question. And the second question is, uh, can you, even if you were able to evaluate the capacity expressions, well, we know that there are random coding schemes because you can prove coding theorems using random coding schemes, but can we do better? Can you design explicit capacity achieving coding schemes which are efficient with efficient decoders and coders and so on? Okay, so these are the questions that we'll try to address in this talk. Um, yeah, uh, it's like just like, uh, so at this stage, it's, I guess, maybe I'll just give you a quick outline of what I intend to say in this talk, uh, the technical aspect, technical part of it. So we'll give, a, I'll give a brief review of the uh, relevant literature, I'll start with that. Uh, there's a lot of literature. I'll try to just touch upon at least the, what I would consider the, the significant ones, um, or significant ones directly related to this talk. Uh, then, so I will start with, I so we'll start with the simplest possible case uh, of a constrained channel, input constrained channel, a binary erasure channel with a one infinity RLL constraint at the input. One infinity just means that between any two ones, uh, that is every every zero run must have length at least one. That is, there can be no consecutive ones. Okay, so the input is restricted to have no consecutive ones. No consecutive ones are allowed at the input to the channel. Um, so we'll, I'll discuss that. Uh, I'll discuss that first at some length. Then we will start by then based upon that I will take off and give more general results or general techniques for handling DMCs with input constraints, especially. And for like in fact, like the more the most the vast majority of this talk will be focused on the case of feedback capacity for a very simple reason. We just know a lot more about it, surprisingly perhaps. Um, and in fact, uh, in, there are there's a very well there's a well-established well mechanism for handling feedback capacity. And uh, it also gives rise to coding schemes. In fact, you can actually, from this mechanism that we will use to handle the feedback capacity, coding schemes also are kind of arise naturally. Capacity without feedback is an entirely different uh, ball game. Uh, not just is, I mean, people have worked on it a lot, but uh, it still remains kind of a mysterious animal. Uh, there's not much that is concretely known about it. Bounds on capacity without feedback, et cetera, we do know. But the, but the most important thing is that we really don't know how to code uh, you know, for input constraint channels without feedback. There are, I mean, we do some, to achieve, let us say capacity achieve, if you want to get to capacity of these channels. Okay. <clears throat> 
All right, so here's some background on like the relevant literature. Um, as I said, there's a lot of it, and, and I, it's not a com comprehensive listing by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but it goes back, I would say, the origins are in the work of Zehavi and Wolf. Uh, so this is initially, I'm just talking about the literature on capacity without feedback. Um, so Zehavi and Wolf motivated by, again, magnetic recording, uh, Jan, magnetic recording um, uh, applications, looked at uh, binary symmetric channel with run length constraint at the input. Uh, they gave some bounds on the capacity, uh, lower bounds and also upper bounds. Uh, then um, a, a, this was also picked up by Shamai and Kaufman a couple of years later. Uh, there's not really much, I mean, there were some minor works here and there, but like, you know, in the intervening years between 88, let us say, and about 2006 when, uh, well, uh, yeah, so then I'd say the next is very uh, step up here would be the work of Arnold et al, where like they looked at a uh, general setting of uh, finding or trying to estimate the capacity for general finite state channels of which channels with input constraints are a special case. So they used the Monte Carlo based, Monte Carlo simulation based methods for estimating capacity. Uh, Fontobel et al gave a generalized, generalized the Blehert Arimoto algorithm for this classical Blehert Arimoto algorithm for discrete memoryless channels to the setting of finite state channels with in fact finite state input processes, which is very naturally set, fits into our setting of discrete memoryless channel with finite state input processes. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, it is, it is not, um, its application is kind of limited. This, it's, uh, it does not really give the same guarantees uh, as the Blehat Arimoto algorithm does in the case of a discrete memoryless channel. Um, but let me, yeah, but it is a numerical method. It is a tool that one can apply. Um, there is the, uh, then like Han and Marcus, this is Guangyi Han from, who's currently at the at Hong Kong University and Brian Marcus probably does not read, need an uh, introduction to this audience. Uh, who, so they, they worked on general discrete memoryless channels with input constraints in a series of papers uh, using, they are mostly the techniques that they were using or like what they were kind of approaching it from is, uh, is like if you, if you throw in and let's see, if you throw in, uh, for example, a Markov process into the input of a discrete memoryless channel, what you will get at the output is what is called a hidden Markov model, hidden Markov process. And, they are, and if you want to understand what the information rate or the capacity or mutual information between the input and the output is, you will have to really understand what the entropy rate of the output Markov process is, output hidden Markov processes. Hidden Markov processes are notorious. Markov processes, we know how to, how to in, it's a very simple, we learn this in the first course in information theory, how to, what, how to compute the information, the uh, uh, entropy rate of a Markov process. But we also learn in the same first course in information theory that a hidden Markov process is very difficult to actually evaluate the entropy rate for. There are bounds that you can find in the book on core and Thomas, for example. Uh, so like they spent a lot of time, Han and Marcus did, to try to get uh, build tools for computing or how, how, how the entropy rate of hidden Markov processes actually behaves. For example, is it an analytic function? Is it an analytic function of the process itself, of the description of the process? Things of that nature. Um, see, for example, so, so the reason for looking into something like this is that if you wanted to use these techniques, to get to capacity of some of some class of channels within this class, then you want to maybe, for example, you might want to use some variational methods, uh, maybe a gradient methods to nudge your optimization problem in the right direction, right? You want to maximize the entropy rate of an output process uh, and, uh, you know, subject to with your process being, the input process being within some class of distributions. And if your output, and if you know, for example, that the output process behaves in a, in a, if the entropy rate of the output process behaves nicely or smoothly with respect to the input distributions, then you can try to use gradient-based methods. So they'd spent a lot of time doing these type of things, trying to put that on a rigorous first setting. Uh, then Han uh, by himself has been also working on stochastic approximation type algorithms for giving numerical lower bounds on the capacity of such channels. Uh, Han, uh, Guangye and his student, uh, Yong -Yong Li, uh, Yonglong Li, um, looked specifically at the binary erasure channel with a, with the no consecutive ones, the one infinity RLL input constraint that they gave. Uh, in particular, they were able to characterize effectively the, the, what they call the asymptotic capacity, asymptotic in the sense that at epsilon, the erasure, as long as when the erasure probability goes to zero in that small regime of vanishingly small erasure probability, what, like, what does the capacity look like? And they were able to, to, uh, to give an expression for that. 
Um, uh, then, like um, on the other hand, these are all essentially you can think of these as like the prior work as mostly concentrating on lower bounds on trying to estimate the capacity from below by taking input processes and trying to evaluate information rates of those input processes. The upper bounds, uh, I'd say the most important, the kind of the upper bounds that are maybe uh, uh, the more general, most general family of upper, upper bounds are what we will, uh, what come from this method called the dual capacity method. Um, I, given some time, I might go, I might be able to get to this method at the end of this talk. Let's see. Uh, Anyhow, so Tangaraj initiated study of this, uh, applied this method uh, in uh, to the to study of binary input channels with run length constrained inputs. And uh, this was also picked up in a later paper that we also worked on and uh, kind of uh, extended this technique a little bit, a little bit more. And finally, uh, um, yeah, so in an ICTA paper like earlier, just last year, um, we, my student Arvind and I had some dynamic programming based lower bounds on the capacity of these kind of channels. Um, <clears throat> for, with feedback, I would say the story really of capacity with feedback starts with the work of Tatikonda, with PhD thesis of Tatikonda, um, uh, under the guidance of Sanjoy Mitter at MIT. And uh, so they realized that this capacity calculation can be formulated as an average reward stochastic control problem. So Mitter comes from a stochastic control background and like he realized that it fits in very naturally in that setting. And there is a, once you know that it fits in that setting, there are, uh, there are tools developed within that community, dynamic programming methods that are completely set up for the evaluation or at least the numerical evaluation of these, of this, of this type of, of this type of framework. Uh, so capacity can actually be numerically evaluated using tools from dynamic programming. And so they did this and they showed the results for a binary symmetric channel with the no consecutive ones, with the NBA, which is this one infinity RLL input constraint. Uh, then much uh, for about 10 years further down the line, like uh, Hein Permuter, who had already worked on like uh, giving analytic, trying to approach this dynamic programming method to, uh, to get analytic expressions for capacity of various finite state channels. Uh, then with the help of his student, uh, so he, he put his student Aron Sabak to work on this, like for uh, whether you can actually do the same sort of a thing. Uh, can you actually analytically determine the capacity of feedback capacity of a, of a, of a PMC with um, with a running constraint at the input, uh, is that so? We so so Sabag or on Saturn you know, worked this out, and uh, and not I will explain some of this stuff here, and it is completely non-trivial the solution. Um, so the, he was able to give an exact determination of the feedback capacity of a binary erasure channel, and in fact this was also later extended to a binary a general binary input binary output channel, for example a binary symmetric channel with. Uh, one infinity RLL input, RLL input constraint. Uh, then uh, the, once this, once the, we are, once there was a method of approaching this, attacking this problem, then like you know one could uh, consider or uh, think about how ways of generalizing this beyond a particular one infinity RLL or particular instance of the BEC or a general BBO channel. So they gave this class of uh, techniques based on what are called Q graphs. I will explain this in this talk as well. On the, to approach the feedback capacity of finite state channels in general. Uh, then in further work, uh, Pellet et al. Uh, gave the exact determination of feedback capacity of a binary erasure channel with a zero K RLL input constraint. This actually got the best paper award at the ISIT a couple few years back. And then uh, ourselves my student, uh, we just gave, submitted a paper on the uh, D infinity RLL input constraint on, for the same channel. This has been just submitted to the ISIT. Okay, so that is the background. Um, and now, without further ado, I, like I will let me get into the problem formulation, um, the, you know, the technical, okay, uh, the expression, the feedback capacity expressions and so on. So I'll start with like the feedback capacity, as I said, for the most part of this talk, because we know a lot more about it. Techniques are quite nice, well-developed now. Uh, capacity without feedback, it is quite a bit, it's a still the wild west. We still don't know much about it. Okay, so I may touch upon it given sufficient time at the end of the talk. Questions, if there are any questions, please uh, <clears throat> feel free to ask them. <clears throat> yeah, so, so here's the expression for input constraint feedback capacity for binary erasure channel, where you have a one infinity RLL constraint, there is no consecutive ones at the input. It's a very simple, that, that complicated uh, N letter expression involving limits and suprema, et cetera, becomes a simple, simple one parameter optimization problem. 
it's an optimization of a real of a of a real variable where this real variable p belongs to the interval 0 to half c sorry uh, the real variable belongs to the interval from 0 to half and uh, it is this expression that needs to be optimized it's as easy as it gets okay, you can throw whatever optimization you can throw calculus at it okay uh, okay it is not a closed form expression in that like i don't know what the particular optimizing value of p is and so that i can't just plug that value in and get an expression it, it it will be a transcendental equation that I will get. If I, for example, differentiate this, uh, uh, if I take the derivative of the objective function and set it equal to zero, I'll get some equation for P that I have to solve and take, solving that numerically, plugging that value back in into the, into the objective function, give me the expression for capacity. <clears throat> All right, uh, but it is simple. It's remarkably simple. And for example, if you set, in, if you set epsilon equal to zero here, uh, you will precisely, let me see, yeah, so I'll, I'll come to that. So here is the plot of the capacity. Observe that it has a, this interesting concave shape. Okay. Uh, if you recall, the capacity of, a, of an unconstrained binary erasure channel is simply a straight line going from one, it's a one minus epsilon plot, right? It goes, it's a straight line going from, uh, it's a straight line that will go from one here all the way down to zero. That would be the capacity of, the capacity expression for an unconstrained DEC. For a constrained BC, what specifically this one infinity parallel constraint at the input, is you get a concave shape for the curve. Different from, an, for example, any other channel that we know for a discrete memoryless channel. Discrete memoryless channel capacities are generally convex. But for example, the binary symmetric channel capacity, if you look at it as a uh, the capacity for a binary symmetric channel as a function of the error, of the error probability, it's a convex shape. One minus H of T is a convex shape. But here it is concave. So this is interesting. Uh, then, uh, so, and at, when you put an epsilon equal to zero here, it's just evaluates the log of the golden ratio, which we, which of course, as we all, as many of us know, it is the capacity of, it is just the noiseless capacity of the uh, one infinity RLL constraint. <clears throat> okay. So, if there are no erasures, then like any, then there is no need, any, any, uh, we don't need extra, we don't need extra coding over simply the noiseless constraint. All right. Uh, so the, how do you, how does this compare with, for example, the non-feedback capacity? So we do know that now the feedback strictly increases the input constraint capacity. This can be gleaned from both like this work of uh, Lee and Han, who, as I said, pointed, looked at the expression for the non-feedback capacity in a small neighborhood for epsilon close to zero. So, and then we can, by looking at that expression and comparing it with our expression for feedback capacity, we can show that the two expressions, the derivatives at zero actually differ. So the two expressions are not going to be the same um, uh, for epsilon values close to zero. Uh, erasure probabilities close to zero. Um, this, kind of, but then Tangraj actually Tangraj's upper bounding techniques using the dual capacity method actually gave upper bounds that are uh, gave upper bounds for the noise for the non-feedback capacity for the binary for binary erasure channel with the one infinity RLL input. Uh, as you can see, I think that is the uh, in the inset you can see that as the any of the dotted bounds, the red dotted bound, the red dashed bound or the blue dashed bound, which lies strictly below the black curve, which is the feedback capacity curve. These are upper bounds on the non-feedback capacity. The dashed bounds are the non-feedback capacity upper bounds, which lies strictly below the, the black curve, which is the feedback capacity curve. Naveen, is this for all um, for all channels or just for the V? This is a binary erasure channel. So, no, no I, mean, I mean, the fact that feedback strictly increases, this, this result can be shown for like all channels with the one infinity constraint or just? Um... Uh, we know at least for the binary erasure and the binary symmetric channel, that's much okay. The One more question, no. the, the, your um, result on the previous page, I'm, I'm just curious, is this a constructive result? I'll come to this, I'll, I'll show you what, what Thanks, thanks, do. all right, thanks. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so I'll give coding schemes. Once you know this, what you're looking for, Coding themes are, by the way, completely non-intuitive, completely non-trivial, like, but you have to know, yeah, you have to essentially go through the process that we went through to be able to get to those coding schemes. All right. But they're completely explicit as well. And once you, once you see them, they're mind-blowingly elegant. All right. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, so let's see. So all of this really stems from the dynamic programming formulation of feedback capacity. Um, and uh, so let's let's get into that. 
if, like see, there is this is not the time this is, i will only be able to give you an overview of this this is not that place to learn about this this is how good this is like deep stuff not uh, hard and like you know lots of people have spent many many years working on this type of thing and i'll just say that like our problem fits into this into the setting that is really all that you should be taking away from this how it fits into the setting i'll give you the ingredients of that but i don't really expect that like if you never seen this before you will not understand what is happening in all likelihood okay so the so this is our, our expression for feedback capacity now experts on the who know anything about dynamic programming would immediately recognize this as being looking like something what is called the reward of an infinite horizon averaged reward dynamic program in the stochastic control uh, community this would be a natural thing to look at um, so so people did make a lot of people have made this connection now and uh, so again starting with the work of tatikonda and a lot of people have exploited this connection as well since then i mean this is actually i've stopped this at 2015 there have been considered many papers since then as well i think this slide was actually drawn up around 2016 <clears throat> uh what is a dynamic program okay a dynamic program is effect just a is a discrete time dy dynamical system okay it has a certain number of, it has a certain ingredient it has some ingredients which i'll try to explain so there is a discrete time dynamical system that evolves in time according to a according to this update equation zt or these zs are the states at time t okay the, so there is a state evolution that happens across time it's a discrete time system and there's a state evolution of that of that of that system uh the state at time t is called zt it takes some it takes values in a state space z which could be continuous it could be a compact uh, set for example um and but then you can say that like uh, it, it can also be random that is the initial state it will be initialized by some z not the initial state z not uh, could be a random variable random state itself with some distrib initial distribution um okay then there are also the the other thing is actions and what are called disturbances actions are see finally what what we want is there is something called a reward that is going to be associated with the trajectories of of the states of um, of this dynamical system uh at every step of the way there is a certain reward or a cost associated with taking that step if it's a reward you want to maximize the reward that you get if it's a cost you want to minimize that cost it's all there for there there's two sides of the same coin um now when you're sitting at a particular state at time t minus 1 you want to decide where to go next in order to maximize what is called the long term average cost okay so it is not a short term you want to not just maximize an immediate reward you want to re maximize the reward over a long period of time uh that is you want to maximize your cumulative reward that you get over an, over a long period of time so you decide upon an action to take where to go next so there is a set of actions that are allowed so they take values in some action space and you can how you how you decide what action to take could be defined by a policy there is a particular mechanism of choosing actions which is called a policy and the mechanism of choosing actions could depend on uh, so it depends on the, everything that you have done up to that point okay so it is the entire history of the system up to that point the history of that system is actually encapsulated by a very simple thing because the way the system is set up um uh, so the initial state of the system and then what are called the disturbances of the system up to time t minus 1 so now i am sitting at at a state zt at time t minus uh, zt minus 1 at time t minus 1 i want to decide where to go next so i take an action that i believe will maximize my long term average reward uh, eventually further down the line i take an action that that sets me along in the right direction i i i i choose an action that allows me to go to a state that kind of is in the right direction of where i want to go in the long run however this the environment nature is not allowing me to do exactly what i want it also throws in a curve it's a disturbance that like well it, it, it's some random variable which which will throw throw off the system which will not ex, which will cause the system to not behave exactly as the way i intended it to that i would like it to but like it will there's some noise that gets thrown in it's called a random disturbance and that is some distribution of that disturbance as well so the actual state at time t is going to depend on the state at time t minus 1 the the action that i take at time t which is then up to me to decide what i want to do but the disturbance is not within my control but the disturbance is also going to be affecting the next state that the system goes into okay so there is a, there is a stochastic behavior here <clears throat> okay that is why it is called stochastic control so this ut is a control parameter and then you are, you are, you are able to see what state you are in at time t minus at, uh, where you are in you are able to see but you are not able to precisely control where you want to go next you have some loose control over it but finally there is also a disturbance that that the environment actually also uh, throws in throws at you uh 
um, so this is the so i talked about the reward function this reward function depends on the state you are in as well as the action that you take uh, because actions may have costs or rewards associated with them and the state you are in also has costs the state you want to go to uh, state uh, that you are in uh, will also affect what the reward that you get next days so rewards are each at each step you get a reward and you want to as i said like the the goal is not just to maximize the immediate reward it's not a greedy thing you want to maximize your long term average reward Okay, so you want to max the goal of the dynamic program is to maximize this quantity, what is called the long-term average reward. Every step of the way, you get some reward, and that you are looking at the arithmetic average as you go from you take n time steps, divide by n, let the limit as n goes to infinity, and the expected value is because there's a lot of you know unexpectedness in the system, randomness in the system. There is random choice of uh, you know there's random disturbances, there is random initial state, even the policy could be random. So all of that gets that gets thrown into this expectation. Okay. So there is an expectation, there's an expected behavior of a long-term average reward that I would like to maximize. So this is called an infinite horizon average reward problem. Okay, and you want to choose a policy, a way of choosing actions at every step of the way that allow you to that maximizes this long-term average reward. So I want to choose a policy. Choose a policy that is a, that gets me get, gets me to the reward rho star, which is the supremum over supremum of the long term average rewards across policies pi. Now compare this. This is directly comparable. I mean, now see this is this this is the long. This is what the dynamic program. The goal of the dynamic program is to is to get to here this maximum average reward, maximize this long term average reward. But then look at the compare that with the capacity expression. I mean, it, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between these things. I mean, as long as you set it up in the right way, you will see that there is this can be there is a way of setting up the problem of capacity by capacity so that the ingredients exactly fall into the ingredients required for setting up a uh, for formulating a stochastic control or, or this dynamic programming problem. That is all that we need to know from this. How you do this precisely is not relevant. Okay, so I took this to my particular talk here. That there is a correspondence is what we really want to know. That we that we need to know. Uh, okay, once you set it up, what do we do next? How do you actually get to this? Once you set up this problem, what can you do to it? How do you actually evaluate this? It looks like a pretty complicated thing. Your policies could be complicated. So how do you actually evaluate what the optimal policy is? How do you evaluate what your optimal long-term average reward is? What the maximum average reward is? How do you evaluate these things? There are tools for this. One tool is the so-called Bellman equation. There's a, there's a certain operator. That is a complicated operator. I don't, as I said, this is not the place to learn about it. But people who want to know this, this h function is what is called the 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 cost to go function, the reward to go function. H is basically tells you if I'm a but if I'm at state z at a particular time instant, and what is uh, if I use the, from that point on, if I use the best policy, what is the best average reward I can get in the long term? Okay, so that is this t of if I use so h is basically what is called the uh, the long it is called the reward to go function or the or the cost to go function anyway there is a dp operator that tells that like every step of the way uh, what how the long term cost function gets updated okay, so there is a recursion that tells you how it is precisely what is called dynamic programming if you know anything about dynamic programming it's a, it's a recursion dynamic programming is basically just a recursion it tells you how the long term average average cost gets updated once you take a single step Okay, that is that is basically what this DP operator is doing. It's telling you what the recursion is between the long-term average reward at a particular at a particular step at a particular time instant, and then what happens the next time instant. Anyhow, so there is a particular operator that operates on functions uh, from the state space to the real numbers, and if you set up this highly non, it's a highly non-linear operator. If you set up this sort of, a, it's not exactly a fixed-point equation, but it is a uh, what is called the Bellman equation. That is, you look at the operator uh, operating on a function h. Uh, if that operator operating on the function h, the reward function, the long reward to go function h, spits out the same reward to go function h, perhaps, but up to a shift, okay, shifted by some constant, then uh, th this equation is essentially like a fixed point equation, but fixed point, but by, by, by except fix, not necessarily a fixed point. Fixed point would be when rho is zero. It's a shifted fixed point, if you like. Uh, then uh, th I mean, this equation is what is called the Bellman equation. So if you can find a solution to this Bellman equation, that is the DP operator T is just is an operator that is defined from, from the problem setup. You can define it explicitly based on the problem setup. 
to you can set up this equation the where problem is, the thing is you want to now find a solution to this equation that is you want to find a bounded function a reward to go function z h and a row for which this equation is satisfied for which this update equation is satisfied this fixed point equation the bellman equation is satisfied if you are able to do so then this row that you get from this equation from the solution to this equation is in fact row star okay it is actually the optimal maximum average reward and this is one method of approaching problems like this if you set up a complicated nonlinear equation to solve if you are able to solve it then you have your answer okay and uh, yeah so i will uh, so this is the setup okay this is how there is the correspondence between dynamic programming and capacity calculation there is a, there are states action disturbances and rewards there are there are information theoretic or probabilistic you know kind of counterparts of this that like if you define this in this one to in this if you make this correspondence between these these quantities on the right and the corresponding ingredients of the dynamic program you get precisely the the feedback capacity formulation of uh, the feedback capacity formulation as a dynamic program the thing i want you to focus on here is actions actions are you remember what is an action action is you are a particular you are at a particular state and you want to decide where to go next actions for us are going to be input distributions if these are constrained input distributions that is like the input distribution what is the distribution on the input at time t given that the state of the constraint at time t minus 1 is known to us okay this is exactly like you know dkrll constraint if my if if i'm sitting at a particular state of my presentation at time t minus 1 i want to determine where to go next what do i want to throw into the channel at the next time instant uh, the this uh, this input distribution is precisely what i require to op, you know to optimize over if i want to calculate channel capacity that input distribution is precisely my action in the dynamic programming formulation okay and the action i will say here is uh, i allowed to depend on all the outputs up to time t minus 1 that is one take away from this the action that i take at time t that is this input distribution that i that i want to have at time the action at time t the input distribution to the channel at time t it is depends on all the outputs that i have seen up to time t minus 1 this is known to both the encoder and the decoder Okay, all the outputs seen up to time t minus one would be known to both the encoder and the decoder. The action is only taken at the encoder. The decoder is somehow expected to follow the the outcome of the action. So let me. So let's let's go on. I mean, I don't. I just want you to get some feeling for this, and I also want to get you a get a get. Want you to get a feeling for how complicated this this thing will. no is actually is in practice so this is a dp operator for the binary er er erasure channel if i throw in a function h at it h of z the the what the operator throws out is some complicated function like this again a function of z but it's a much more complicated function it involves like a you know binary entropy function and some supremum over other it's a supremum over some optimization problem it's another optimization problem it's a complicated thing this is a dp operator so you want to set up this guy you want to say that you want to you want to set up this equation rho equal to i mean rho plus h of z equal to this okay you want to solve this equation not obvious it is not easy it's a extra it's a complicated non linear equation to solve so what do you do how can you solve something like this there are numerical methods so at least try to understand what is happening in the dynamical system you can just take this operator take some start with some you know what is called a value this is also called a h is called a value function take some value function keep applying the operator to it numerically do some numer numerically evaluate the, the dp operator and keep doing this over and over again and then you will see some sort of behavior start happening so after you do this value iteration algorithm after 20 iterations of value iteration algorithm you will see that the value function starts to look like this for the particular case of epsilon equal to 0.5 erasure chance erasure, erasure probability half uh the actions are in there's a particular interpretation of this but anyhow this is numerical methods trying to determine what the value function is going to look like see you if you if you hope the hope is that after you keep iterating uh, long enough you'll start to converge to something that is the value function will start to converge towards the fixed point of the bellman equation that is the hope 
fixed point being that is a, it will get to a you will get to a value function that satisfies the bellman equation sort of after sufficiently many iterations so what you will see happening is you will see that at some at after 20 iteration the value function looks like this uh, apply the dp operator to it again what is going to, what you should see next is you will see a shifted version of the same value function okay at that point you know that then okay convergence is starting to happen and the, the the quantity the amount of the shift will precisely tell you what the what the optimal average reward is so this can be essentially calculated numerically but our goal is beyond that go beyond that and do this analytically as well so what happens is also another thing that we, we were able to see that like once you calculate once you did all of this we can also simulate the system once you are able to see what the op, you know what what your uh, you know from from this bellman equation numerical from the numerical method of the bellman equation you are able to get op, you are, you can get some actions optimal actions to take at every um, the, what the action function looks like um, action function as a function of the state you can see that also from the you can get it from this from this value iteration algorithm uh, you simulate the dynamical system under this of action function and what you will see eventually is that the dynamical system uh starts to will 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 uh settle into one of exactly three states for the particular case of the epsilon equal to 5 uh, epsilon equal to half erasure channel the dynamical system that the, the, the dynamic program the dynamical system uh, you know the the dp uh, the dynamical system according to which the dp evolves settles into one of three states it just keeps shuttling between three states this is a rather remarkable thing because the actually the state space of the dp is actually a continuous state space is a state of, it is actually a probability distribution okay the state space is a pro, is a state is a space of probability distributions on input alpha, on the input alphabet but then it is saying that like you only settle on three probability distributions within that state space only three probability distributions at the input matter only three input distributions you're going to shuttle between three input distributions depending depending on which particular state of uh, the dp you're in Okay, which is a rather remarkable thing, um, and from this, the student or on some conjured up a solution from this purely staring at this. Okay, this is all these did stared at this, used like basically reverse engineering to conjure up a solution to that Bellman equation. The solution looks like this. um it is pure guesswork looking at the shape of the curves try to do curve fitting finally you get something that looks reasonable then once you uh, once you believe that this is a solution proving that this is a solution is not a problem you can do this easily getting to the form of the solution is completely guesswork i mean guesswork means informed guesswork based upon numerics okay and that is how we that is how this original thing was actually solved and one more thing came out of all of this um that uh, the uh, once you know how to solve this problem you can also then some the solution the bellman equation as i said like you know the dp this this the, the input distributions it turns out only three input distributions were only three types of input distributions were required to get to the optimal reward to get to the feedback capacity and you have to shuttle between one of these three input distributions that is one of these three types of uh, uh constraint input distributions that uh, you know that is these these one of these three types of actions uh it is like if you if you are the, the, there are only three dp states the states are like labeled by z equal to 0 z equal to 1 and z equal to 1 minus p epsilon at each state you take one of the at, for each state you have these actions actions are stochastic matrices uh which depend like there are two rows and two columns because like here we are only looking at the 0 1 rll constraint and uh, so it is all you need to know is whether the previous bit was a 0 or a 1 to determine what the next bit is to be um if the previous bit is a 1 you know the next bit next bit that we to be transmitted into the channel has to be a 0 which is always the second row the second row of this stochastic matrix tells you it, it it is the probability of the next bit to be transmitted into the channel being equal to 0 or 1 uh given the fact that the previous bit transmitted into the channel was a 1 the previous bit transmitted into the channel was a 1 the next bit has to be a 0 so the probability of the next bit being a 0 is 1 the first row of this stochastic matrix 
is is the row that gives you the distribution of the input bit when the previous bit sent into the channel was a zero so there is no constraint anymore on the next bit to be transmitted into the channel all right anyhow uh, i think uh, yeah i'm pretty sure i've lost most of you um, any of the, i let me kind of tell you that uh, this is all very abstract perhaps but it gives rise to concrete coding schemes and i will explain the coding scheme one size but that coding scheme cannot really be derived without going through this process of obtaining this optimal policy when i get to the coding scheme the coding scheme i can explain to you by itself stand alone but where did i dream this coding scheme up from there is there be no basis for dreaming up a coding scheme like that unless you had gone through this process of deriving the optimal policy okay all right uh, So, so let me. Uh, I think I'm probably I'm not going to be able to get to, to uh, explaining all the fine points of all of the of the policy, etc. But let me get to the coding scheme. And the coding scheme, as I said, actually is a paradigm shift. You have to think about it differently. Uh, and yeah, that kind that kind of thinking only can come only is natural when you look at this or end of an optimal policy. Uh, um, so coding scheme is the following i mean this is a completely explicit coding scheme for a one length limit for a, a one infinity rl input constraint thrown into a binary in a binary erasure channel where you get feedback from the output okay the output is fed back into the input for fed back into the encoder um so the message we will take the message so you have m messages to be one of m messages is going to be picked and trans and uh, Picked to be transmitted. Um, so the messages are uniformly distributed over a set of messages, set of capital M number of messages. We will consider these messages to be points on the real number rack, on the interval between zero and one. So messages are simply mapped to points within the interval from zero to one. Okay. One of these messages is the true message to be transmitted. The uh, the transmitter knows this, but the receiver does not. So the job of the transmitter is to convey enough information to the receiver, so that the receiver is able to zero in, narrow down the possibilities for the actual message being transmitted based upon the transmissions, based upon what it is what the receiver is seeing. The advantage that the transmitter has is it is also able to see what the receiver is seeing, but of course with a delay of one bit, causal. You cannot anticipate what the receiver is going to see, but once the receiver has seen what it is seeing, the transmitter also sees what the receiver has seen. Okay. I hope you were able to get that bit of a tongue twister there. now the coding scheme itself is based upon two labelings of the intervals from 0 to 1 you put a line at a, at a, you know so labeling 1 gives all the messages uh, gives a label 0 to everything to the to the to the sub interval from 0 up to 1 minus p p being some particular probability uh, probability value between 0 and 1 which you choose to be the maximizing parameter for that optimal for this Uh, objective function like that came into the feedback capacity expression remember so you have you know in hindsight this is the optimizing p epsilon is optimal value of for p but it this the scoring scheme will work for any value of p but to get to the largest rate you will need to get to the you will have to use the optimizing value of p for this expression so pick a value of p between 0 and 1/2 when you draw a line uh, uh, within the interval from 0 to 1 at 1 minus p for labeling 1 and for labeling 2 you draw a line at p So the for labeling one, like anything to the left of p, uh, left of the line one minus p gets a label zero, and anything to the right of one minus p gets a label one. For labeling two, it is anything to the left of p gets a value one, gets a label one. Anything to the right of p gets a gets a label zero. These labels are actually used to determine the current bit to be transmitted by the encoder. Okay. Okay. So for example, you always start with labeling one. So initialization is always with labeling one. So remember, one of these messages messages is the true message. Okay, I will denote that by zero. I mean, by a shaded bit, by a shaded circle. Uh, so always initially labeling one is used, since the true message falls within the sub interval from one, where the label is zero. So the encoder, the transmitter, will initially transmit zero. So the bit transmitted is zero. Okay. Now let us see what is happening in the channel. Um, so in successful transmission so labeling so the the dp there were three remember the optimal policy were concentrated on three dp states there were three states for the and at each state you had a particular policy to choose at that state so this is the state the policy diagram that i showed a few slides back 
Okay, so that is what I'm showing at the bottom here. So the, this is this uh, red circle is the ground state. This is the unconstrained state. You can do anything you want in this state. That is, there are no constraints upon what you can throw into the channel at that state. So at that, when you are in this state, when both the encoder, when the encoder knows that it is in this state, the decoder also actually will, will know that it is in that state. Uh, then you'll always use labeling one, the first labeling, okay, to, to determine what is to be transmitted next. So this is what the encoder has done. So this is the message bit, the shaded, the shaded circle. Uh, so the x1 equal to zero is the bit to be transmitted because the message lies within sub interval from zero to one in labeling. And according to labeling one, it is a zero to be transmitted. Um, <clears throat> note that the optimal action, see, as I said, like, see, the, 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 uh, the action is basically the probability distribution of what you want to send into the channel at what, knowing that you're at this particular state. So I want to send the probability. So this, uh, the first of the, the first row corresponds to unconstrained. There is no, the previous bit is zero, previous channel transmission was zero. So there are no constraints, there are no constraints about what you can put into the channel next. So the probability with which the next bit to be transmitted into the channel is a zero is one minus P epsilon, one minus P. And the probability with which the next bit to be transmitted in the channel is one is, is P. Okay? That is the probability distribution, input distribution. This is not going to play a role here because when you are always in the state, in the ground state, in the state here, the red state, uh, only when the previous bit is a zero, the previous bit is a one will take you to some other state. Um, okay, but this is the policy. Now at this state, whenever you know that you're in this state, you'll always use labeling one to carry out your transmissions. And that labeling, you just, you just, and all you're doing is determining where your message is in sub-interval corresponding. To, are you in that sub-interval corresponding to labeling label zero or are you in the sub-interval corresponding to label one? This is known to the encoder always. The decoder does not know this a priori. So what happens in transmission? So, so a zero gets transmitted. Note that since all messages are equally likely, the probability that a zero gets transmitted when you are in this state, when you are in this, uh, by this labeling, the probability that a zero gets transmitted is precisely one minus P epsilon. Okay, I mean, maybe after rounding errors, because it's a discrete probability set, it's a discrete set of messages, but like there are a large number of messages, you can see that all messages being equally likely, then the probability of choosing a message within the sub interval is basically one minus P, one minus P. Probability of choosing a message within the one sub interval is P. And that is consistent with the optimal action at, at this state at the state, at the red state, at the red circle state. So a zero is transmitted and the zero is successfully received. If a zero is successfully received, so it is this transition, the red transition that is taking place in the, optim in the policy diagram, the optimal policy diagram. Okay. Um, and so that keeps you within the same state, within the same DP state, according to the optimal policy. So you're going to continue to use the same labeling one to determine the next transmission as well. But now both the encoder and the decoder know that the first transmission was a successfully a zero. So all of these guys can be eliminated at both the encoder and the decoder end because that is correspond, those are messages corresponding to the first, success, first transmission being a one. Both the encoder and the decoder know now that those messages are out of the question. Those could not have been transmitted. Okay. Um, now, so now we can focus entirely on the set of messages corresponding to the label zero. You expand that out to now you like kind of you do, you zoom this out. So like you expand this and to expand the set of messages to cover the entire interval again from zero to one. And you use once again, the exact same labeling, the labeling one, okay, to determine what to transmit next. So labeling one is determined by again setting a line here, one minus P epsilon and to the left of the line, if the message that you were to be transmitted now lies to the left of this line after expansion, you send a zero and the next bit, next transmission is zero. Otherwise the next transmission is a one. Now I chosen this black uh, circle in such a way that after expansion onto from one, from the sub interval of length one minus P all the way up to the interval of length one, uh, the, the black message now goes to the uh, sub interval labeled one. So the next transmission is going to be labeled one is going to be a one. Okay. So the encoder is going to transmit that next. So that is what the encoder is does. So time and sent one, that encoder has transmitted one. Okay, what happens? So suppose that one is successfully received. If the one is successfully received, so the encoder has transmitted one, then the transition that is taking place in the DP state diagram is this guy here. It is taking you to a different state now. 
because both the encoder and the decoder know that one has been received. It's a successful transmission, non-erased. One is received, that takes you to the next state. But then according to the constraint, the next input into the channel cannot be a zero, cannot be a one. So the one has been transmitted. The next constraint says that I cannot transmit a one again. So the only thing that the encoder has to, can do is to transmit a zero. And no matter what the receiver sees, whether it's a zero or an erasure, it knows that having seen a one previously, it knows that encoder must have transmitted a zero in the next time instant. And then it goes back to this state here. Both encoder and the decoder know now that after the transmission of the next zero, you're back in this state. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> And once again, once successful, after a successful transmission, you can eliminate the possibilities of things that could not have been transmitted. And you, after elimination, you'll be left with a subinterval of messages and you expand that subinterval of messages again back all the way to the full interval. You keep doing this as long as there are no erasures. But once erasures happen, you go to a different state. Okay? You go to this third state within that DP state, within that DP state diagram. Uh, so here, let us see what happens in the erasure process. Okay, so first time instant, like a zero was transmitted, and then it got erased. Okay, the message that transmitted transmitted a zero in the first in the first transmission, it got erased in the channel. So that shows this why why one is zero. But like so, it got erased in the channel. And now, what what is the decoder? What 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 is what is the what is the next thing to do? If an erasure happens according to this DP state diagram, the transition diagram, you must go into this. The state that you get to is this DP state one minus P. What do you do? What is the action at that state? The action at that state is this fellow here. Okay. The action at that state is this fellow here. Um, so whatever you do has to be consistent with this action. The optimal action at this state, according to the optimal policy, is this fellow here. So whatever you do at this state must be consistent with that action. So what is the what do you what do you do here? So what happens now is that we switch labeling. Once you get an erasure, you are, one, if you are using labeling one first, and you see that you got an erasure at the output. You switch to the next labeling, you switch to labeling two. Okay, so what happens then is the following. See, if you, what, what, what that means is the following. You switch to labeling two. Why do you do that? It is to keep yourself consistent with the optimal policy. Labeling two tells you to transmit a one uh, if your message now lies in the subinterval, uh, the first subinterval of length P, or you transmit a zero of the message now lies in the next, the, the remaining part of the sub, remaining part of. Uh, the interval from zero to one of length one minus p. Uh, this is consistent with the optimal policy. Why is that the case? See, pre, pre, this remember the rows of this matrix of this optimal policy matrix correspond to the conditional probability of what the next thing to be transmitted into the channel is conditioned on what the previous thing transmitted was. The first row is the previous thing transmitted was a zero. The second row is previous thing transmitted was a one. The previous thing transmitted was a one. You must always transmit it as zero in the next time instant. The previous thing transmitted was a zero. Then you have some freedom in choosing in determining what to transmit next. With probability p epsilon over one minus p epsilon, you can transmit a one. With the remaining probability, you can transmit a zero. So in the previous time instant, if you had transmitted a zero, if your message was such that you transmitted a zero, then you want to make sure that in the next time instant, you transmit a one. Conditional probability of transmitting a one is p over, p over one minus p. And that is that is given by that is consistent with this labeling. This labeling makes you allow, allows you to do that, because uh, all, among all the messages, among all these one minus p fraction of messages lying in this interval, a p fraction, a p further fraction, gets the next uh, gets the label one in the next labeling, the labeling two. And that is this that gives you this problem. So what is then the what is then the conditional probability? If, if you know in the previous transmission, if the transmission was a zero, what is the conditional probability of transmitting a one? That is given by p epsilon over one minus p epsilon, consistent with the optimal optimal policy at this um, at the erasure DP state, DP state corresponding to an erasure received. <clears throat> okay, and uh, so uh, this is how these two labelings are basically uh, used or defined. And what happens next? Now again, if you get a second erasure, you flip back to the original labeling, labeling one again. And the labelings have been chosen in such a way as to keep yourself consistent with the optimal policy. If a zero was transmitted in the previous time instant, then the probability with which you transmit a one in the next time instance is consistent with the optimal policy. If a one was transmitted in the previous time instant, as would have happened here, x2 is one, 
then you are forced to transmit a zero according to labeling one again because that message the sub interval now i mean after a one you must necessarily transmit a zero when if you get an erasure okay <clears throat> So you keep, as long as you get erasures, you keep flipping between these two labelings. And you keep doing this as long as you get an erasure. As soon as you get a successful transmission, then you get into one of the other two DP states. A successful transmission will get you to one of the two other two DP states for which I've already described what to do. If you're in the DP state called one, you always use labeling one thereafter for the next time, for the next transmission. If you're in DP state, what is called zero, that you can only get to that DP state if the previous transmission was a one, in which case you must transmit a zero. And the receiver also knows that. Okay, this is the policy coding scheme. I mean, it's a completely where I'm, where, you know, out of completely out of left field, and without knowing the optimal policy, there's no way you could have come up with such a coding scheme. And this is an optimal coding scheme. If you can actually you can carry a rate and carry out a rate analysis of this, you will see that like you know, if you define the rate to be the expected number of information which per successful transmission over the expected number of channel users because it's a variable rate coding scheme the expected number of bits per how many information bits are there per successful transmission see at every time instant you're transmitting either a, a single bit okay and you want you want to know okay and what's the probability of a, that bit being a zero or a one either according to label zero or label one the probability of that bit being a zero or a one is always p epsilon because how many bit, the fraction of bits, the fraction of messages, because all messages are equally likely, fraction of messages in each of the labeling, the fraction of messages which get the label zero, or which, which get the label one is P. So uh, at every time instant, the probability of transmitting a P, uh, unconditional probability of transmitting a P, an unconditional or whatever happened in the past, unconditional probability of transmitting a one is always P. So you're always transmitting a Bernoulli P bit. So if that P bit gets through, in a successful transmission, the amount of information that you have conveyed in that successful transmission is just the entropy of that bit. Okay. So that is the entropy, the successful transmission contains H of P information bits on an average. You can, this is intuition, it can actually make all of this rigorous if you like. I mean, we can, it is all explained in the paper if you want to read it up. Okay, that, that is number one. Number two is the denominator. How many channel users do you need per successful transmission? Well, it is the same geometric series. You keep getting erasures until you get a successful transmission. Erasures happen with probability epsilon. You have to, you might get a chain of success. You might get a number of erasures, a geometric progression of erasures until you get a successful transmission. So the number of transmissions up to you get up to the point that you get a successful transmission on an average, the number of transmissions required is one over one minus epsilon. But then there's a caveat. Uh, if the last guy that you successfully transmitted turns out to be a one, if the one got successfully received, then you know automatically that you have to waste an additional channel use to satisfy the constraint. The next channel use must be a zero. And that's a waste of a channel. It's a waste of a channel use. That channel use will convey no additional information. It is just to satisfy the constraint because the previous bit that was transmitted was a one. The next bit to be transmitted has to be a zero. So you waste that extra bit with prob so with probability P, you will waste that extra extra bit. So the expected number of channel users is one over one, over one minus epsilon. But with, with probability p, there is an extra channel use, so which is which you get added to the expected number of channel users. All right, and the, therefore the rate is exactly the the the, the uh, objective function that we had in the feedback capacity expression. And like you, and you pick your probability p so as to maximize this objective function, and that gets you to capacity. And I think I might as well stop here. Like I, with the rest of it, like I mean, you know, I, 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 there's a lot more to go, but like uh, we can extend all of this. Like <clears throat> you know, the these ideas basically are extendable. Once you get this idea, the main takeaway from this is the following: that <clears throat> DP policies, <clears throat> I mean, solving the DP gets you an optimal policy. From optimal policies, we can get coding schemes. For the binary, binary erasure channel, these type of coding schemes are based on labelings of the interval from zero to one. For the binary symmetric channel, coding schemes are more complicated. They are based on what, the, what is called the principle of posterior matching. I may not be able to get to that, but there is some, there is other things. So let me just give you I, uh, sort of what else we know about this. I don't want to get into any more detail about what techniques we, what are techniques we use. 
what else do we know about the feedback capacity problem alone? Um, we know, for example, that uh, for the zero K RLL constraint, the exact feedback capacity for the binary erasure, erasure, erasure channel is known. There are similarly, there are similar expressions involving optimization over a single parameter, single real variable, as long as the input constraint is a zero K RLL or a one two RLL constraint. So this was in the paper of Pellet et al. <clears throat> And we have now also D infinity is actually still open by and large. Uh, we know we have an answer, partial answer for D equal to two and small epsilons within a particular range, erasure probabilities within a particular range. So there again, we know that uh, what the feedback capacity is. It's again given by an expression like this. Um, yeah, so these are some plots compare, comparing our feedback, what we know about the feedback capacity for input constraint DCs for the D infinity case. <clears throat> There are upper and lower bounds, which are all pretty close together. So we know a fair amount, but we don't know it exactly yet. Beyond the BEC for the B binary, for the general binary input, binary output channel, uh, Oran Sabag actually solved the DP for that. And I, I will assure you that that DP is far more complicated for the DP for, for the Bellman equation for the, uh, for the binary erasure channel. Look at the solution. It is a, it's a crazy solution. This is complete. It was just pulled out of thin air. And um, yeah, so the feedback capacity is given by this. Again, it's a single parameter optimization problem. Once you know what the optimal policy is, again, based upon solving the Bellman equation, DP, et cetera, you get an optimal policy. Once you know what the optimal policy is, from that you can conjure, cobble together a coding scheme. In the case of the binary, for the case of a uh, BIBO channel, binary input, binary output channel, the coding scheme is based on the principle of what is called posterior matching. Uh, yeah, so this is like, these are the curves that look for the binary symmetric channel, the capacity curve looks like this. For, any, for the one infinity RLL input constraint, the capacity curve, the red curve is a no, this is just a one minus H of P curve, the unconstrained capacity. Constrained capacity is this guy here. This time it is con it's a convex shape. <clears throat> and again, we know that here in this case, the feedback does strictly increase capacity. The, 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 the bounds, <clears throat> the black curve is the feedback bound, the feedback uh, expression, expression of feedback capacity. And uh, the other curves are upper and lower bounds on, uh, on the non-feedback capacity of the binary symmetric channel uh, with a one infinity RLL input constraint. As you can see, there's a gap. Um, I, I guess I'll stop here with maybe with one comment that like, uh, see for in the, in the capacity without feedback case, we have very little, we really don't know much. We can know, we can get lower bounds and upper bounds. Um, lower bounds are almost invariably obtained by picking your favorite type of input distribution, input processes that respect the input constraint, typically Markov processes and try to evaluate, throw that Markov processes into the channel, throw that Markov process into the channel and try to evaluate this information rate, either do it numerically or somehow analytically using bounding. Um, numerical methods are Monte Carlo simulations, this generalized Blehat Arimoto algorithm, stochastic approximation. <clears throat> Analytical methods gives you bounds, give you bounds like, so for example, we know that for the DKRLL input constraint binary erasure, binary erasure channel with erasure probability epsilon, the feedback, the non feedback capacity is always lower bounded by the noiseless capacity times the capacity of the erasure channel. It's not, I don't know, we don't know if actually this is not an equality, we know that it is lower, it's a strict lower bound, we know that too. But what, what the actual value is for CDK epsilon, we don't know. Um, we can't even extend this kind of inequality beyond the binary erasure channel. I don't know that such an inequality exists. It has been conjectured by Zehavi and Wolf back in 1988 that even for the binary symmetric channel, you should get something like this that the capacity of the constraint. Uh, for a noisy binary symmetric channel should be lower bounded by the noiseless capacity of the constraint times the capacity of the binary symmetric channel. We don't know if this is true. We don't have a proof. Upper bounds, well, feedback capacity is an upper bound. So that's another good reason to look at feedback capacity. Feedback capacity gives you concrete upper bounds. Uh, 
and the other thing is this dual capacity method that uh, yeah which is something that you ought to know about but unfortunately i don't have time to get into uh, but yeah and, and one thing is that none of these methods give insight into coding schemes so this is actually an open problem still coding schemes for these type of questions with non feedback coding schemes without feedback non random without more explicit coding scheme than some random coding scheme um so yeah so these are really wide open problems and like and three, another class of really wide open problems on which almost zero is known nothing is known is how to handle for example two dimensional input constraints so with that i will stop um, and like oh, i hope i hope you got i got conveyed something out of this uh, it is not material that you will ordinarily see i think uh, but uh, i think it's yeah it's 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 a uh, yeah i'll just say it is it is it is kind of interesting at least uh, that uh, you require non conventional techniques to handle this type of problem All right, thank you, thank you, Nabin. Ah, this is a very interesting talk. Um, yeah. Before I ask my questions, <laughs> does anybody have any of the audience have questions for uh Professor Keshav? Uh, hi, Nabin. Uh, thanks for the yeah uh great talk. Yeah, so you're sharing with us a very nice and comprehensive work on the design of this uh. RLL code for the BEC channel with uh, with feedback feedback and result feedback. So it seems it's very interesting uh, uh, academic problem, but I am not very sure huh? for for such kind of constraint code uh, with feedback. So yeah, it seems is it uh, very practical because I, it seems to me it may not be applicable for data storage channels mm -hmm. because if you have feedback during the encoding and decoding problem. Uh, the process, right? You may have the problem of error propagation, right? Because your encoder, decoder are working based on the assumption that the previous transmitted bit is successful, right? But we know the channel will always have noise and interference. So this is one problem. Another problem is a uh, delay. Yeah. Well, so, okay. So uh, yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. And yeah, uh, well, I'll address it in like, there are many different questions there. Well, firstly, feedback is not, uh, yeah, feedback is actually not the in, like the encoder and the decoder are seeing the same thing. So the noise does affect whatever the noise coming out. Feedback is the feedback the output into the input. It is not uh, uh, only for successful transmission. It is for whatever is being seen at the output is being fed back into the input. Okay, but your input is based uh, is working based on the assumption that what you assume is error free, right? Your input. Uh, no, 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 no. Not really. Not no 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 no. What you receive is what you receive, but that is being faithfully conveyed back to the encoder, saying this is what I have received. That is what the encoder is operating under. So the feedback is noiseless, not yeah, the feed forward. Noiseless feedback, yeah. Okay, okay. So 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 your feedback can can be can be erroneous. That may have error. That is correct. Fair enough. That is true. That okay. is number one. That is of course true. So that is so this will not and that that's another very difficult problem. Noisy feedback. It cannot be handled through these techniques. I see. Okay. Um, that is not, that is one thing. Um, yeah, so that uh, that is correct. Uh, uh, what else? What else did you say? Uh, what else did you ask me? Um, sorry. Delay. Possible delay. Delay. Yes, delay is another thing that this does not this 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 uh, does not handle. Uh, this formulation does not handle by this formulation. Yeah, does not handle delay. Uh, so that is correct. Um, um, okay. So like so from a practical standpoint. You, you mean like if I yeah for from from a from a practical meaning if you want to use this to divide device coding schemes for use in practice maybe not not very useful but what I would say what the most important thing from for this for studying the reason for studying feedback capacity is that it does give you upper bounds on on things that we don't know anything about that is the feedback that is capacity without feedback yes yes yeah yeah and these are non-trivial upper bounds mm -hmm. and upper bounding techniques are actually difficult also for this problem. Mm, yeah. Lower bonding techniques are okay. I mean, you know, you feed in something. You know, it's an it's a supreme it's an it's a maximization problem. So you feed in anything achievable is an upper is a lower bound. How do you come up with upper bounds? Upper bounds are hard to come up with because converses are generally trickier. So there are these two techniques: upper bounds. Either one is a feedback capacity upper bound or the so-called dual capacity upper bound. 
yeah. dual capacity upper bound is generally uh, tighter than feedback capacity upper bound but uh, mm -hmm. feedback capacity upper bound is also it's it's a cleaner formulation let us say feedback capacity upper bound it can be there is a well established method for mm -hmm. getting to that upper bound yeah yeah true it's very interesting yeah problem yeah and also it's tough problem yeah yeah. Naveen, can I ask you a question? Um, typically, when when you prove these coding theorems, um, I mean, you have this idea that the block length goes off to infinity. But you showed that when you have feedback, you have constraint, sometimes you don't have to have any of these fancy coding schemes, right? Um, does that does that hold true for all the known results? For feedback, uh, constraint channel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like I mean, you don't the feedback get so, turn off to infinity. Right. Yeah. So at least, like you know, so this like there, there is this well-known, uh, not I don't know, well, well-known. Let us say within uh, the particular context um, of if you look at memoryless channels, unconstrained memoryless channels with feedback, uh, there is a coding scheme. This posterior matching, or like this, yeah. this business of posterior matching. This is a well-known, I mean, th this work goes back to the work of Horstein in 1961. So from 1961 onwards, this has been known. That this, there is a method, a particular way of doing it. It is kind of, it is sort of reminiscent of, if you like, arithmetic coding. I mean, if you, yeah, I don't know, I can't, I don't want to explain it beyond that. It is kind of keeping track of posterior distributions, okay? You know, depending, trying to determine what to transmit next into the channel, based upon updating of your posterior distribution of the input message, condition what you have seen in the past. Mm -hmm. So that is called posterior matching. Uh, there's a way of doing that. There's a recursive way of doing that. And it it's a very, once you see what is going on, it's a very simple coding scheme and like it achieves capacity directly. To prove it, that it does is non-trivial, but it achieves it capacity. It doesn't require uh, infinite block length codes. Nothing like that, no. Oh. Infinite block length means like, uh, yeah, so these are variable length coding schemes. So uh, yeah, you know, so if you keep, um, you must keep an error budget so you can you have to do one of two things either let the variable length you, can, you cannot know you cannot have any bound on the on the length that you require to get a particular bit to get through yeah right like i did in the erasure in the first case yeah. how, how many times i need to transmit the array a bit until i'm sure that i have successfully gotten through you know in the case of in the original like the the motivating example that i gave Yes, here, right? This here, like you keep repeating until like, unsuccessful run, until you get it through. I mean, here you don't keep a bound of total. I mean, I can't bound. I can't say that like you know I can only use the channel x number of times to me until I am sure that this gets through. So yeah. either you have to keep a. If you want to keep a bound, then you must have an error budget. Yeah. Because there's always a chance that like you know your erasures will sort of you'll keep getting you'll get you'll get desperately unlucky and you will not be able to get this through in that within that particular error budget okay. so, so variable encoding schemes already already have that so either you you can keep a tight you can ask for like a, you, you stick to a particular block length but then you will get a small amount of error yeah uh, but if you allow for variable length then yeah you i mean it's not infinite block length per se but there's no bound on the block length but your variable your length. your multi letter capacity regions uh, capacity expressions all are asymptotic in nature. Right? Correct. It's That's just right, that yeah. the single letter versions for the results we know somehow um, are quote unquote practical. Uh, modulo what you said about um, the stochastic stochasticity of the network. Yeah, right. Okay, thank That's you. Actually, yeah. right. Okay, so I have a question. <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, what's the main obstacle in using the DP method for channels with uh, feedback? Because it, it's just a matter of omitting one one parameter of the the the, the memory no the feedback of the output right? So, I mean, w w without feedback, it doesn't apply. The method does not apply. Uh, the I mean, the DP need not. I, I don't. Know. It, yeah, the problem yeah. formulation is no longer like uh, fits into the formulation of DP. It just does not. Um, let's see if I can uh, let's see if I can say that. Uh, I think later on, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So this like. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 where is this? Um. 
<clears throat> yeah, see, I mean, like, okay, what, like, uh, I guess, let me, um, So these type of problem formulations are based upon the fact for DP, it is kind of or like you know, these, uh, uh, this particular reason that DP works here is based upon the fact that there is something common that both the encoder and the decoder see. Okay, it is they all, both of them see the out, not only do they have a common knowledge of the coding scheme, both of them have common knowledge of the, all the output seen up to time t minus one. Okay. And that is crucial in making sure that the encoder is able to develop a simplified coding scheme that allows the decoder also to follow the encoder. I see. So, okay. So I guess somehow your Bellman equation can be... No, the, the, you can't set up the problem itself. The problem itself cannot be set up in the form of a DP, like for, for the non-feedback case. Actually, I thought if you have a finite state channel, you can you can set up the DP, no? I mean, mm. like yes. like you just need a finite like a finite state channel. No, you can't. Mm. The reward functions, etc. Well, not, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the reward function might. The reward yeah, function yeah. cannot be set up yes. in the way that you need the reward function to be set up. Yeah, yeah. I can I can somehow see. Yeah. 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 I have to look at the Bellman. Yeah, yeah. The whole whole setup. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so I mean, like I said, see, see the, uh, the thing is that like this, this mutual information term um, cannot just be split into something like this, uh, terms like this, that xt and yt conditioned on things that you see in the past. This xn, yn term, mm, 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 you will not be able to do yeah. this kind of a causal conditioning. Okay, yeah, that will be, yeah, okay, so that's the main problem. Mm. The main problem is that, yeah, the causal conditioning will not be possible. Okay, I see. Mm. Mm. Okay, I see. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, so, so, so as your as your as your for your RLL, if your when your D, I think I I guess when your your constraints gets more complicated. Uh, your number of output space also uh, increases, I guess. Is it, is it exponential? Sorry, can you say that again? So just now you showed for the one infinity, you need three three different yeah. spaces. Okay, right? uh, I don't have, so does, any, yeah, does it I don't have anything else yet. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a very good question. But okay, let me go one, one. I'll come back to this, but let me, I, I, so while I was thinking about what you were asking earlier, uh, there's one yeah. more thing that I will say. In this paper that, uh, so we studied this like in like in the paper, the ISITA paper of 2020 that I submitted, like we did look at dynamic DP for capacity of, for non-feedback capacity of finite state channels. So you can't do it by itself, okay? We can't like by itself, you cannot be, the capacity itself cannot be formulated as a DP, but we can formulate lower bounds on capacity as a DP. We tried that. We didn't really. Yeah, we got some things, but like it was not nothing that gave us really any serious improvement. What was over what was already known. Ah yes 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 okay yeah that's what thinking. yeah sure sure yeah because you can come out coding schemes from there just to kind of ensure this. Uh, yeah, maximum. but they'll yeah. be far, they're not uh, they won't be yeah. capacity achieving. Yes, so that is our goal. In fact, that is a goal for us. In fact, is can you do good lower bounding? Can mm. you can, can you do can we at least get to good coding schemes based upon lower bounds through DP? Mm -hmm. DP based lower bounds. Okay, so that is something that is an active that, that we are actually actively working on. We have a. I see. Yeah, yeah. sure. I mean, yeah, you, also have, sense. you also have this paper on upper bounds, right? Using DP. And not. Uh, yeah, that's right. So that is. A, yeah, that's a funny. That's a funny use of DP. Uh, so that uses this. That is this paper of Fulaihel. I mean, this is Fulaihel et al. It is. It is actually using the dual capacity method to <laughs> upper bound, but to evaluate see. the dual capacity where you. So you use the DP. Yes. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Okay, thanks. 
yeah so it's not dp i mean yeah it is to evaluate to calculate a certain dual capacity you calculate a certain expression that you get in the upper bound you use dp mm-hmm. okay so you can do that like you know so that type of thing one can do but what you're saying is that the problem itself doesn't admit itself to a dp, DP formulation DP. but like you can bound it above and below by problems that do admit dp formulation got it okay got it thanks mm-hmm. okay cool okay so the other question what was your question okay yeah so um uh how about oh, says asked about like the how complicated does it become um yeah so i'll tell you that uh, uh um yeah so for these at least for the particular like the the problems for which we know answers uh, like the zero k rll and one two rll i think uh, the zero k rll i think it if i am not completely mistaken it is i think uh, the number of dp states required is of the order of k only k maybe k plus 1 or k plus 2 uh number of states needed in the optimal policy same that's so 1 2 anyway is a specific number doesn't matter uh, uh, for d uh, infinity d infinity we are trying we are seeing that with d infinity it looks like there's an exponential blow up okay uh that is we require i mean the the lower bound that i gave here uh used a policy uh for which the number of dp states number of states in that policy is basically number of different distinct input distributions is of the order of 2 to the d plus d d plus 2 to the power of d okay i see this huge okay uh um, and we don't have the exact answer and so but I, we expect that uh, it is of that at least to uh, something like that is d, d plus 2 to the d is what you will need and uh in fact we don't even know if it is necessarily a finite state optimal policy because i said the optimal the state space itself is an is a comp, is a continuous state space so policies can actually take can take on any value within that state space but then it turns out somehow that like in these problems it just happens to collapse into a finite set of uh, you know states but this, that is another set of another problem that we have been that i've been i guess mulling over for the last many years or without any insight i have asked experts also why does this happen that law why does it complicate it why why do why does a dp which we define start off by defining it defining it you define the dp on a continuous state space then it turns out that under the optimal policy it just collapses into a finite state machine mm. interesting so yeah. when when does this happen i mean can you so and like is this always true for this type of problems or why can you say something about it we don't know actually we don't know anything about that okay all right yes. all the problems that we are able to solve exactly that does happen okay. hmm interesting yeah all right so um uh, do we have any more questions okay all right then okay okay all right then. So let's uh thank our speaker again. Um clap. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh Okay, all right. So our next talk will be uh two weeks later cause it's the lunar new year. <laughs> yeah. So um eh, two weeks? No, three weeks later. Yeah. So so on the 23rd of uh, February. All right. So till then um yeah, for those who celebrate lunar new year, happy new year and uh yeah, stay safe and healthy. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, everybody. Thanks, Navin. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. Stop.